Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to another edition of The Negro and the Law, a reply part 2. And this very important notice to you, our dear viewer, that this video is not made with the intention to offend anyone. It is not a propaganda video. It is made in good faith for educational and reference purposes only. Please look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. Remember, among the adventurers in this trade, the British possess at present the greatest share. It was during the government of the Commonwealth that Negroes were carried in any numbers to the British West Indies and then chiefly to Barbados. A few indeed were brought to Virginia by a Dutch ship as early as 1620, but it was the Royal African Company that first carried on from England a vigorous commerce to Africa during the reign of Charles II, and this was by Robert Norris in a book of 1789 titled A Short Account of the African Slave Trade, published 1789. And from the British Parliament, in 1830, slaves, as we may read in Henry's History of Great Britain, were formerly an established article of our exports. Great numbers, he says, were exported like cattle from the British coast and were to be seen exposed for sale in the Roman market. And this is from the abolition of the African slave trade by the British Parliament, Volume 2, published 1830. And here are our goals on this channel the videos are not made for you to believe us or to believe whatever we say but for you to look for the materials referenced and study them yourself feel very free to tell us where we misconstrued or misunderstood what was written when you read it yourself we focus on books and other materials published at least before 1950 and our ultimate goal is to wake up our people to get them to start using their brains that they are blessed with by nature. Remember, when you believe us, you're going to tell the next person that we said. But when you study it yourself, you're going to tell the next person that you know, or at least based on the accounts of those who were alive then or who witnessed what was happening, you know. And from Malcolm X, if you are not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. And that's exactly what you get in a place like Nigeria today, where you see the army who were the slave hunters simply because they now wear uniform, oppressing innocent people, killing the same people they captured and sold as slaves. You will be defending and supporting them, having excuses everywhere for them to justify their man's inhumanity to man. Remember, the army was a slave hunting militia. It was only renamed and rebranded in 1863. And to the comment to which we are issuing this response, recall from part one of this response video that we were not able to accommodate question five in our previous video. And that question five says, with all the followers he has and thousands of dollars in donations he has accumulated over the years, why does he not try to build Igbo land from within? At least, if Namdekano slash IPOB create projects to build either a school, a hospital, support agriculture, or you know, anything at least, would that be so bad? Instead of sending the youths to their early death by fueling an unnecessary agitation. This is a very deep question, deeper than you might be seeing especially if you are in the diaspora or you do not have a good understanding of the slave trade and how it happened and also who the slave hunters were and are today and who the slave master operates through. These are very important questions we need in order to answer this question. And please remember from his question too that says, why does he want to convert the Ebos to Judaism? A religion that any enlightened African knows is that of the slave masters. But from this question alone, it is very easy to see that whoever is writing the question is either a proxy of the slave master 
or a descendant of the slave hunters or a negro that is still under the yoke speaking for master so that's ideally how you get them they will always say Igbo remember Igbo was all the slaves exported from the bites of Biafra and Benin but they now tweaked it a bit and gave it a smaller identity to a smaller group for the conquest to continue which is subject of a different video so in his question he is saying the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra is trying to convert the Igbos to Judaism and that tries to insinuate that Biafra is all about what they now call Igbos. Remember, it's an identity they are giving all the Negroes. They break them into smaller chunks. If you look at the slave master himself, the capital of the slave trade, he will never mention the name Biafra or Ambazonia as it were. He will tell you it's Igbos. Everywhere he has done it, he's been doing it for centuries, which we shall prove to you in a subsequent video. But we can very quickly see from this little write-up about the Landa brothers, how the slave master demonized that term Igbo. Note this very well. Look at the British. Anywhere they talk about Biafra or the war, they will always be saying Igbo. It's something very common. You will notice it in everything they do. And so we quickly see where it says the plan was to proceed overland from Badagri. Badagri was where the slave port in the Bight of Benin was in a northeasterly direction, essentially following Clapperton's route, reaching the Niger at Busa, where Mongo Park had drowned 24 years before. Remember, Mongo Park was killed by the Fulanese, and it goes further to say, and then descend the river in canoes to the Gulf of Guinea. They explored upriver from Busa for about 100 miles before commencing the float down on 2nd August 1830. They were attacked and plundered at a place called Kire and taken prisoners at Ibo by King Obi, who demanded ransom. Please remember that at that time, because the people were being raided and captured by the Europeans, every European was a suspect. And if you notice from this account here, it says Ibo, at Ibo. Where is Ibo? Where is Kire and King Obi? And that's why you see they created a replica of what you will call king today. You see Obi of furniture. It was a throne made by the British, just like the Oba of Benin. They were all created by the slave masters. Those things were never there. It is part of the conquest. We shall look at them in a subsequent video. Our interest is for you to read this. It is from a journal of an expedition to explore the cause and termination of the Niger by the Landa brothers. You see how they put it here that they were taken prisoners at Ibo by King Obi who demanded ransom. And we would want you to compare this with what they tell you today that Ibos love money. They will try to make you believe it is true. Why they are the ones stealing, they are the ones doing everything. We will show you part of their game in this video. And so please remember that Ibo simply referred to all bite Negroes. That's what it was. That's what they coined it as before now. Remember, predicting the slave master and his slave hunting partners is very easy. If you study their history and how they work, it follows the same pattern every now and then. The same pattern. It doesn't change. And so, our little example was the case of that Ijele speaks. If you recall, we told you that despite the noise you hear from people saying they will deport him, some of those saying that were actually paid. The slave master is a subtle beast, but he is never smart. So they were saying IPOB was planning to deport him. Remember, nobody is IPOB. Bear that in mind. And IPOB is not the government of Turkey. They are not the ones that made him an illegal immigrant in another person's country. So there is no way they can threaten to deport him. So those are schemes used by the slave master to deceive everybody and to create a scenario where you will think he has some problem with IPOB so they can be walking through him. The slave master is never smart. He is not as sophisticated as you might be thinking. We already know that his foot soldiers, they lack humanity, they lack common sense. But the slave master is a sort of beast. And so here, on the 26th of November, 2020, you see Ijele speaks, saying, leaving the court, Namdekano's case adjourned to January the 27th, 2021. 
And our little question to you, if you are one of those that are being taken in by his lies, who do not know who is sponsoring him, but listening to him, is he a lawyer? Is Chizromo Febu, aka Ijele Speaks or Udele, as he is popularly called, is he educated? The answer would be no. Is he a member of the house? Is he a government official? So who is financing him and why? That's your question. He came back from Turkey. Whether deported or not is an arranged deportation they wanted to bring him home. Remember, BBC Ibo interviewed him as well. You have to begin to ask yourself those questions. What is their interest? This is somebody who has no known job, professionally unqualified. He didn't graduate. So he has nothing he is doing other than the slave master paying him to be used against his siblings. So our question to you is, if you are following him, what is he doing for you? He is telling you that Kano is a scammer, telling you how Kano is working with the Nigerian government. So who is he working for? How come he went back from Turkey? He was begging people for money to call lawyers. How did he appear there? So if you are still following him, you see how foolish you can be. We were able to predict where they were going when BBC was started interviewing him. Remember, the slave master is more interested in one Nigeria than anyone else because he feeds from it. You need to bear that in mind. This is like somebody helping them to sustain the slave trade. The same thing they did during the slave trade proper. Recall also from the previous part that we showed you the definition of Biafra from the site ipobgovernment.org and Wikipedia. Did you observe that Wikipedia had changed from what you saw in that site to West Africa while the people there were either too lazy or didn't know when they changed it? Remember, part of the advantage of the slave master's lies is when you key into them, you won't know when they change. And we will use this Biafra question to prove it to you. And please let one question you must have at the back of your mind be, why did they change from Nigeria to West Africa? And so please, as a recap from that website, it said Biafra, officially the Republic of Biafra, was a secessionist state in eastern Nigeria that existed from 30th May 1987 to January 1970. Remember, this was our interest. And in our last video, we told you that was where they copied it from in Wikipedia, which you can see that it is now saying Biafra, officially the Republic of Biafra, was a secessionist state in West Africa that existed from May 1967 to January 1970. And if you are somebody that reads between the lines and you can pay very close attention to details, you will see that it has changed from Nigeria to West Africa. We went one step further to see when that revision was made because we will shortly tell you why they are making it. Like we told you, the slave master is never smart. You can predict him to 100% accuracy. And so you see on your screen, revision as of 9.20 on the 6th of July 2017, it now says the same thing the other website is saying, Biafra, officially the Republic of Biafra was a secessionist state in eastern Nigeria that existed from 30th May 1967 to January 1970. You notice that the lazy folks in IPOPgovernment.org were too lazy. They didn't notice that the slave master had changed their own to West Africa since then till now. So that's why Kano cannot work with such people. You need to understand it. They don't know their history. They are still following the slave master and his lies. So if the slave master defined Biafra as a kingdom that existed in the moon, that's what they will copy, which is the difference between them and Kano. Kano will tell you, no, this is not correct. It doesn't exist in the moon. But then your question now will be, why did they change from secessionist state in Nigeria to secessionist state in West Africa? And then you notice that they went to put it in Wikipedia. And if you have been following our videos, we had consistently maintained that Wikipedia is not a good reference to cite. These are part of the reasons. You see how they carefully went and changed it there. But the question should now be, why did they make that change from Nigeria to West Africa? Let's read one or two other sources before we tell you why they did. It's a very simple thing to show you because the slave master is very predictable. He is never smart. Without his brainless foot soldiers, there's not much he can do. 
and from this 1971 article it says the republic of biafra was a short-lived secessionist state established in 1967 by the Igbo in bracket Igbo people of southeastern nigeria we wanted you to notice that they still have nigeria in some other places but we want to tell you why they put that west africa you saw there and also from encyclopedia britannica it says biafra secessionist west african state that unilaterally declared its independence from nigeria in may 1967 and so we want you to note the Igbo there that's one thing the slave master never misses because he is behind all the problems going on there we will prove it to you you don't need to worry yet then you notice that the secessionist tag is also the slave master's game everywhere he has it you can't change that thing in any written material he imposes his lies on people that's how he conquers but his brainless foot soldiers because of their lack of humanity and common sense he is able to impose his lies on them in return for little tips you know little things he gives them which we shall look at in a subsequent video but our interest is for you to have seen how this definition is and he has nigeria everywhere so the question of west africa why they changed that wikipedia one to west africa is very simple if you notice you may have been hearing some of them tell you that biafra was so large that it covered a large part of western africa if you have also listened to that illegal immigrant in turkey Udele or Ijele speaks, you will hear him claim that Biafra was in Cameroon. This West Africa they changed here is simply for them to now be able to say that Biafra you are talking about is not even in Nigeria. And even if you think it was in Nigeria, it encompasses all over the place. Just the whole of West Africa was called Biafra. That's what they want to do. You don't need to believe us. You will see them do it. They are very predictable. And so please find and read Buried for 50 Years, Britain's Shameful Role in the Biafran War by Frederick Forsyth. It's an article that will help you understand what is going on. The slave master is a subtle beast. There is nothing happening there that he is not the one behind it. And so in this article, you see how the man put it here. It is a good thing to be proud of one's country. And I am most of the time. But it would be impossible to scan the centuries of Britain's history without coming across a few incidents that evoke not pride but shame. Now remember, this thing he's talking that is shameful, it is not shameful to the Fulanese because they were the slave hunters. As far as they are concerned, they were doing what their God said they should do. And the British saw in them a willing tool for the project. The unfortunate path is onlookers will see it as black people showing man's inhumanity to themselves, whereas the Fulanese are not technically black people based on their classification during the slave trade. So you understand what games they are playing. Remember, this starvation of children orchestrated by the British through his slave hunting partners at that time was why Steve Jobs abandoned Christianity and Islam. A young man named Bruce Merrock set himself on fire, calling for ceasefire over that starvation and the atrocities of the slave master and his slave hunting partners, and yet nothing could change them. So to the person that asked this question of Jewish or non-Jewish, we ask you, where were the African countries? How can you now believe that these people in Nigeria are the same? How can somebody whose only interest is killing you, killing your breadwinners, and you claim they are the same people? And although we normally reference materials that predate 1950, on this occasion, let us quickly reference The Brutality of Nations by Dan Jacobs, and it was published 1987. And here, we are told that the road north from Port Harcourt would be best, but the Nigerian commander in the area Colonel Adekunle was adamant that no food go into Biafra. Now, if you read this, you might be tempted to somehow believe that Biafra was anywhere outside those areas. They were the same thing. But at that time, they convinced the rest of the world, the same way they did, that they were behind the slave trade themselves, that Biafra was only what you would call South-South today. They also went on to claim that they were fighting to save the minorities. Remember, the slave master will always tell a lie to deceive people. 
Now ask yourself, if they claimed that they were fighting the war because Biafra was only southeast as they call it today, not south-south. Remember they were also fighting in the southeast and they also captured Enugu. So if they were telling you that this side was Biafra and this side wasn't, it's all a lie because they treated all sides equally. They massacred everybody. If you also notice, they don't treat anyone from the south any different. And for the records, let us read one more page from this material and then we we'll tell you something you need to know about the southerners that they use. Most of them are actually Fulanese. And so here you see where it says, Adekunle had just embarrassed the British by thumbing all relief plans for Biafra, misguided humanitarian rubbish, saying that any food sent in would only go to soldiers' stomachs and help prolong the fighting. Now, ordinarily, when you look at it, you will say Adekunle is supposedly a black man, but like we told you, the army were the slave hunters. He has been conditioned along those lines. That's why you see people in the Nigerian army, and when you see how they kill their own people, you will see that they have been conditioned as the same slave hunters they were before 1863, when they were now renamed army. That they are called army does not mean that the same thing like your US army or British army. They were the slave hunters. They lack humanity. They lack common sense you see here, Adekunle continues to say, its port facilities were needed exclusively for military supplies. He was, as always, blunt. If children must die first, then that is too bad. Just too bad. Ojuku could stop the war. Please remember that those ports are still closed today. They closed the land ports, which is a deliberate thing between the slave master and his slave hunting partners, the ports are open in the north so that whatever is happening there, before you believe what the slave master is telling you, especially in BBC fake news, you know that it must be a lie. As far as it's coming from that place and coming from the BBC, it has to be a lie. And so here again, you see Adekunle says, I want to see no Red Cross, no Caritas, no World Council of Churches, no Pope, no missionary and no UN delegation. I want to prevent even one Igbo having one piece to eat before their capitulation. We shoot at everything that moves. Asked what his forces would do when they overrun the center of Igbo territory. Adekunle replied, then we shoot at everything, even things that don't move. So our interest is for you to note that after he made this comment, he was quickly replaced with Obasanjo. And now permit us to ask you, who do you think redeployed Adekunle and replaced him with Obasanjo. And Obasanjo, if you never knew or never thought about it, is not a Negro. He has Fulani blood. And if you doubt what we're saying, investigate it. And if you looked for and watched this YouTube video, you will see that he was invited to a party in Yoruba land and he went and brought Fulanis with him because he works for them. The Oba of Benin is a Fulani man. The Obi of Onicha, if you go and check his history, you will see that he is not from there. Those are all positioned by the slave masters. And this picture tells you all you need to know this picture on your screen. Let us then reference Slave Trade, two volumes, papers relating to the slave trade, session 29 January to 28 July 1828, volume 26, and it was published 1828. And here we are told that... Headquarters, Cape Coast Castle, 27th October, 1826. My Lord, I have the honor to submit to your Lordship the copy of a report received this day, which I considered it my duty to send to Commodore Bullen in order to draw his notice to the Shabro and Galenas. For although the number of slaves exported from that part of Africa bears but a very small proportion to those who are exported from Benin, and Biafra. But today you notice that they make all the so-called African Americans, Afro-Brazilians, Haitians and Jamaicans to think that they all came from Ghana of less than 30 million people. But here we see that the proportion to those who are exported from Benin and Biafra, which is Badagri, Boni and Calabas slave ports, is by far more than what they are talking about in Cape Coast Castle as at 27th October 1826. Our interest is for you to go pick up these things and read them yourself. Now, if you go up on this same page, you see where it says, 
Governor Samuel Campbell, yes, Neil Campbell was the man who signed the treaty with Biafra that ceded the sovereignty of Biafra to the British in return for them to stop the slave trade. But like we told you, the slave master is a subtle beast. If you doubt us, we reference the material. Just put it in the comment section. He was the one that signed the treaty with whoever they called the king of Biafra that ceded the sovereignty of Biafra to them. We are not sure who that is, but that's what they recorded in a book of 1840. If in doubt, put it in the comment section, but look at it on your screen as well. Let us also reference a narrative of travels in the United States of America by William O'Brien, and this was published 1836. And here we are told that how wicked is it for slaveholders to educate their children under the notion that the Negroes have no souls in order to lessen their pity and harden them in barbarity, training them up under the impression that it is as right to hold such in bondage as to keep horses and other cattle in position. So you bear in mind that at that time, the Negroes were not considered human. They didn't have a soul. And this is exactly the same thing they have taught their slave hunting partners. So certain things you would do elsewhere in the rest of the world and you are celebrated. If you were to do it in Nigeria, in Biafra and in Ambazonia, in Cameroon, you will be killed. If people like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Google, Larry Page them and Facebook Zuckerberg were from Nigeria, by now they would have been killed by the slave hunters of old. So let us reference narrative of the life and sufferings of Reverend Richard Warren a fugitive slave written by himself and this was published in 1850 and here we are told that Reverend Richard Warren was born in Gates County, North Carolina on the 1st of December 1812. My father and mother were slaves, the property of Mr. John Warren. So our interest is to show you where the deceit in Dan Calloway and the Aborigines narrative is coming from and where they are headed to. Remember, the reason they are telling you that you are now aborigines is to also change your identity to something else. And so if you compared what Dan Calloway calls telling you how to trace your lineage as being Indian, you will see that when you trace yours, if we assume but without saying or suggesting that you were a descendant of this particular man writing here, then your trace will only terminate at John Warren because the original names of the slaves were destroyed. They were classified as animals. They had no names, no languages. They were naked and lived on trees. That's what they did. Now, the concept that they could have been lying down on the ship when coming, it's not true. If you look at the ships and how they did it, it was just that they were loaded in there as in humans in that ship. They were forced to be there. That's the only side. It's not like they were lying down like you see in some paintings and drawings. That's not correct. And going forward, it says, When I was four years of age, our master removed to Rutherford County, state of Tennessee. Shortly after he got settled in his new home, our family, consisting of my parents and two children besides myself, were sent to the slave mouth in consequence of my master's death and hired out to the highest bidder. It was our lot, as it is with a great majority of slave families, to experience the bitter pains of separation. Although we all resided in the same county, each received a new master. It is not possible for me to describe the feelings that pervaded our breasts when we were taken possession of by our respective owners. The slave mother's love for her offspring is nonetheless poignant because she is a chattel and is liable to be torn away from them by the ruthless hands of the merciless slaveholder. Now remember, this is part of what they want that Aborigine one of the B narrative to help them change. So if they get somebody like Den Calloway to be telling you that you are Aborigines, you are enslaved here, from there, whatever happened will be forgotten. That's all they are trying to do. Nothing more sophisticated than that and so when you traced your genealogy as he claims you will arrive at the names of the owners of the slaves and then because they have names that you may not be able to place where they came from it will now be that you are aborigine you were there and they changed your name there 
they forgot that if you were there they couldn't have found it very easy to separate you anyhow they wanted because from the slave market from the seasoning process the separation begins and they told everyone that the negroes had no attachments to their offspring they are just like animals you don't care about their feelings which is what you see in a place like nigeria today we will not tell you something about that lakey whether claim or shooting or not is a different story but we want you to bear in mind that the same people telling you about lakey shooting and calling panel and all that are going to be able to kill people because that's where the conquest is targeted and so it goes forward here to say she has the same natural affection for her children as white mothers remember at that time the story was that the negroes were like animals they are not attached to their children so if you are a negro black woman or negro woman as the case may be you see why we told you about the alleged killing of twins that it was a lie they tried to suggest that it was the mothers that were doing the killing those are subtle ways the slave master made it look like the negro was not human we were separated and each went to his new home with feelings that can be better imagined than described that's what the people saw and as unfortunate as it is you see how the slave master was able to now use his slave hunting partners to now claim that the negroes could have done it to themselves remember his slave hunting partners are still working with him and the idea that the british stopped the slave trade is not entirely correct all they did was to stop what they were doing because they were behind the slave rates if you notice they are behind all the wars going on in west africa today in biafra and in ambazonia the fights of one nigeria and one cameroon they are behind it so if they stopped what they are doing today and the people there get freedom are you going to say the british gave them freedom the answer would be no but they simply stopped what they were doing because they are the ones behind it remember it is like a town being troubled by some armed robbers let's say a meeting was called and the robbers in that meeting said they were going to fight the robbers because they knew it was them and then suddenly the robbery stopped and those armed robbers now started saying they stopped armed robbery in their city that's exactly the same thing they simply stopped what they were doing at that time even though haphazardly because they didn't want to stop it they have still not stopped it they are behind what is going on in nigeria today in biafra and in ambazonia and that's where the problems lie if they can let go and tell their slave hunting partners to stop what they are doing that place will have peace and so before we leave this material we see that at that time because slaves were not allowed to learn to read or write for those who were expecting to see the records kept by black people if you notice the descendants of the slave hunters when they come here they will tell you that these books were written by europeans but they will never tell you that the guns they used for their slave raids were also given to them by the same europeans they are trying to prevent people from going to read them or read them with a level of bias that will make them not to believe the accounts that's why you hear them saying the books were written by europeans the books were written by the slave masters if you notice this question we are responding to even though we have digressed a lot he also uses their terms cessation agitation and all that because they want the negro to stay docile they don't want him to do anything except what they prefer that he does and so he writes while living with a mr jonathan pope from 1826 to 1829 i learned to read and write the manner in which i obtained this knowledge may be briefly told it is the custom in all slave states to prohibit under severe penalties any slave from learning to read or write any slave caught with a book or newspaper in his possession is compelled to disclose the name of the person who furnished it to him and is subject without to severe punishment our interest is to ask you somebody sat and made these laws that punish the people for teaching the slaves to read and in the same way if you were to look at nigeria today you see how they imposed a constitution on the people and claimed that the constitution was written by the people you notice that the national assembly is basically useless it doesn't do anything those laws are not being obeyed but people cannot speak up because they are still under bondage that's exactly what is going on if you doubt what we're saying explain to us how it was the army that jumped out in a supposed democracy to now declare a group terrorists for asking for freedom 
which is exactly the same thing that used to happen during the slave trade. You notice that the borders in the south are all closed, but they are open in the north. The slave master. Let us reference the debate on the motion for the abolition of the slave trade in the House of Commons on Monday, the 2nd of April, 1792, reported in detail. So, a quick check at the 17th. 92 calendar shows us that April 2nd is also a Monday. These are little ways you can check that the books we're looking at were written actually on the dates quoted. At least it gives you a very strong clue. Even if you don't believe any of these things when you read them, all you need to do is to look at the slave master and his slave hunting partners in Biafra and in Ambazonia. That's all you need to do and you will see what they are doing. Very simple and very easy to see. The slave master is never smart. But his foot soldiers, they lack humanity, they lack common sense. And so why we want you to note that this book was talking about the House of Common and their debates. Some people are now telling you that the slave trade didn't happen. So the House of Commons were debating something that wasn't happening. So you see how that lie collapses. But our interest is to show you who was behind it. And don't worry if you are wondering what is the relationship between all these things and the questions we were asked as regards to the canon, the truth is that it is still the slave trade going on because it's still the same people that did the slave raids and slave hunts at that time that are still doing what you see there today. Otherwise, tell us why any sensible human being, no matter how old, will be shooting another person just because he said, I want to be free, I want to separate from you, I don't want to do things this way. Remember, the academic curriculum in a place like Nigeria is also controlled by the slave master and his slave hunting partners. So they put a lot of lies there so that the children in the next generation will be misinformed, miseducated, and of course, enslaved the same way they've been doing. And here it says a chieftain is in want of European commodities and being too weak or too timid to attack his neighbors, he sends a party of soldiers by night to one of his own defenseless villages. They set fire to it, they seize the miserable inhabitants as they are escaping from the flames and hurry with them to the ships of the Christian traders who hovering like vultures over these scenes of carnage are ever ready for their prey. Innumerable are the instances of this kind to be met with in the course of the evidence. Captain Wilson, a gentleman of unquestionable veracity and honor, saw armed parties going out to score the country for many successive evenings. You have in the evidence more detailed stories of this kind which cannot but affect the hardest heart. Now, just as you think that the hardest heart can be affected by this, you will have pity on the victims it is not for the slave hunters. This is one big secret of the slave master. He knows they lack humanity, they lack common sense. Just look at the Nigerian army, for example, the same way like the Cameroonian army. You will see what we are talking about. These are people that will kill the breadwinner in a family and there is no government to help. So even if a woman is a single mother and has, let's say, a six-year-old child in that place and they murder that woman, nothing is done so that you don't think that the US or Europe is anything like the jungle. That's why if you remember the fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in 1972, they called it Rumble in the Jungle because to everybody Africa is a jungle and it's because of this type of people you see. You see them come on here to tell you it could have been the arrow. When they tell you it was the arrow, this is like telling you that the priests you have today like the Catholic priests or Pentecostal pastors were the ones selling the slaves. That story was designed to make the Negro look like an animal. I encourage you to find time to look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. Keep a close eye on the slave master's foot soldiers, his slave hunting partners. They lack humanity, they lack common sense. Their atrocities, their utterances and their activities will prove to you beyond any reasonable doubts that they were the slave hunters of old. Thank you very much once again for listening.